Hey everybody, this is Pete Bartolazzi. I uh, just want to welcome you once again to another broadcast. Um, today, as some of you probably recognize on the board, I want to talk about the Aleph Tav. Now, some of you have already uh, heard uh, the Aleph Tav and about the Aleph Tav uh, in Scripture. <clears throat> some of you probably never have, but before this broadcast is over, uh, you will understand uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, to begin, I want to read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, obviously, a verse that's a very popular a verse you could have quoted with me. Um, now, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so, uh, a lot of people, in, in talking about this beginning, these first three verses, because it says, uh, it goes on to say, and, darkness was a, uh, and the earth was void and without form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then it goes on to say, and God said, and God said, and so on, uh, through this first chapter. Um, now, uh, a lot of people, you know, when, when seeing the, the name of God here, God's, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A lot of people believe that refers to the Father, uh, just like it often does in the New Testament, even though technically this is the Hebrew word Elohim, the plural form of God. Uh, and then, of course, you go on to see, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. We see God mentioned, and many believe referring to the Father. Uh, we see the Spirit of God mentioned. But a lot of people, they're like, well, where, where was Jesus throughout the Old Testament? Um, you know, obviously, he didn't have the name of Jesus until uh, he was born a man and, and uh, into the earth. Uh, he didn't have that name. Uh, so... Was he inactive? Was he doing nothing until he came? And, and that literally is not true. But there's something rather interesting in, now of course, uh, just to first address that, I should say, um, you know, God, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you have God the Father and the Spirit of God moved to face, upon the face of the waters. You got the Spirit of God. But we know in John uh, chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and this same Word was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. It's interesting to note that when he was talking about the word, then he went on to, to use the, the personal pronoun he. So the word was a person, he, which we know, of course, the word became flesh and dwelt among us in verse 14, and it's referring to Jesus. Jesus was the word. Well, you can find Jesus throughout this first part because everything was made by him. Uh, so every time God said, there's the word. And, and so there is the evidence just in plain scripture in our English translation uh, of God, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ being there, just not referred to as uh, Jesus, obviously, in the Old Testament until he took that name on when he became a man. But there is further evidence here, even in this first verse, of Jesus being there and operating in uh, what he was doing. And, and, we, and this same evidence that we're about to look at, you can find over 7,000 times throughout the Old Testament. And so let's begin taking a look at that. And in the Hebrew, when you're actually reading the Hebrew, we find the Aleph Tav. Now the Aleph is simply the first letter of the uh, Hebrew alphabet. The Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We find these two put together throughout the Hebrew Old Testament, again, over 7,000 times, and yet these two letters put together are not a word in the Hebrew. We consider them, uh, in the English and translating the Bible, we consider them untranslatable because it doesn't, it, it's not a word uh, in the Hebrew. And so these, this olive tav is twice in this first verse, but we don't have it in the English translation because, again, it's untranslatable. But in the Hebrew, it would say, In the beginning, God created olive tav, the heavens, and olive tav, the earth. Uh, so we have that evidence there. Even the Jews, they see this in Scripture, but it's not a word. So needless to say, they have speculations as to what this means, but it's not a word. Now, now I've written a sentence down here below here, um, and with the light glaring on my board a little bit, it might be tough to see. So I'll read this off to you. It's just an English, uh, it's just an English sentence I put together real briefly, and it says, "This is A Z Pete's YouTube channel. Its A Z purpose is to A Z teach the A Z." Word of God. 
Now, I put up a similar example like this when teaching the students. Uh, and, of course, you know, I'll put it up on the board before class and ask me, what's this AZ? Well, what I've simply done is uh, endeavor to give you an idea what it's like for the Jews to read the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, AZ in the English means nothing. It's not a word. Uh, it is simply the first and last letters of our alphabet put together, but it doesn't mean anything. So, but I'm showing you that this is what the Jews see. They see the Aleph Tav. It's not a word, but it's connected. But God supernaturally, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, had this AZ put throughout the Hebrew Old Testament, again, over 7,000 times. And one source even said over 9,000 times. But that at least leaves us with over 7,000 times. So what is this Aleph Tav in the Hebrew Old Testament? Well, it's been a long-standing uh, question with the Jews. Uh, the Strong's Concordance says it's a refers to it as a, uh, a a direct object marker. It is directly connected with people, so I put it with my name, uh, A. C. Pete. Okay, and and then it's also connected with the actions uh, that are taking place, and so I, uh, you know, the A. Z. Purpose, the A. Z. Teaching, the A. Z. Word of God. Of course, that would be again uh, uh, how this is used in the Old Testament. This may not be a perfect example, uh, but it is it is connected with people, and it is connected uh, with with actions throughout the Old Testament. Um, so uh, I first want to then bring out the, the real heart of what's going on here. And, and what I'm going to do is, is in Revelation uh, chapter 1, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, uh, we have the ever popular saying that Jesus made to John, where he said, he spoke to him and said, I am the Alpha and Omega. And of course, we have that repeated again in uh, Revelation chapter 22 in verse 13, where once again, he ends the book saying, making the same statement as he did here in the beginning. He said, I am the Alpha and Omega. Well, you, first of all, um, you got to understand that Jesus, uh, even though he would have understood the common language of the day and would have known how to speak it, which was that ancient Greek that we call Koine Greek, but that was not his first language because Jesus was not born Greek. He was born Hebrew. He was born a Jew. So Hebrew would have been his first language and would have been fluent in Hebrew. And did he use that language? Absolutely, he did. In fact, in um, Acts chapter 26 and verse 14, one of the times where Paul was recounting his road to Damascus experience, he mentioned that Jesus spoke to him in the Hebrew tongue. Wow. He spoke to him in his native language. This is what Jesus would have spoke. John, uh, when he had the revelation, when he was taken to heaven and, and was given uh, the revelation, Jesus, John, being, being Jew, Hebrew was his first language. Obviously would have known Greek, which was the common language of the day that everybody learned, just kind of like English is the common language, uh, the market language, if you would, in the world today. So many other countries are learning English. It's the common language to speak. Greek was in that day. But John was Hebrew. Jesus was Hebrew. And Jesus would have spoke to him. And he would have said to him, uh, I am the Aleph and Tav. You see, what Jesus is doing here with John is, again, it's an age-old question as to what is this Aleph Tav throughout the Hebrew Old Testament. They speculate, but don't know for sure. The closest explanation I heard is one of their great rabbis uh, stated that we believe this has something to do with God. We're just not sure what. And so when Jesus was speaking to John, he was answering the age-old question. He was said to John, I am the Aleph and Tav. He's simply saying, that Aleph Tav throughout the Hebrew Old Testament, that was me. Now, it, it, you know, some people are caught up because John, with, the, with the, the Alpha and Omega, because John, would have re, when he received this, he would have translated what he had received into the common language of that day so that all the Christians are, uh, could read it in that day. Uh, because otherwise, only the Jewish Christians uh, would have been able to read it. Some have suggested he may have originally written this in Hebrew, and then it was translated into the Greek for all the rest of the church uh, and Christians to, to be able to understand and read it. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. 
but he would have at least have translated it into the common language of that day. So in doing so, he would have said, he would have translated, I am the Alpha and Omega. Now in the modern day, when we do the translation, we're not sure what that means. So we just went ahead and translated it with the Greek letters instead of actually translating it like John did, where if we would have translated it into English, we would have said Jesus is the A and the Z. But say, folks, this is a Hebraism. And the old and the New Testament is full of Hebraisms, and all that simply is is where they're endeavoring to translate the, the Hebrew understanding of the Old Testament, the Hebrew idioms and things, and trying to put them in, into the Greek of that day. And then, and it's full of these things. And so people who get so caught up in, in Alpha and Omega, and that's all it refers to, Folks, in the Greek, the Alpha and Omega doesn't mean anything other than the fact it's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. Just like, you know, the AZ doesn't mean anything in the English other than the fact it's the first and last letter of the English alphabet. But the Aleph Tav, even though it means something, it by the Holy Spirit, the inspiration he gives, put this throughout the Old Testament, and it means something there. They just haven't known what. But again, Jesus here is saying, I am the Aleph and Tav. I'm showing you where I was at and where I was operating and what I was doing throughout the Old Testament. So again, we know that all things are created by God. Uh, we also know uh, from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, it states uh, that for by him were all things created, speaking of Jesus, that are in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. This is Jesus. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it's saying, In the beginning God created Aleph Tav, the heavens. There's Jesus. And Aleph Tav, the earth. There's Jesus. Jesus was in all creation. All things were made by him. Now, to begin to further understand this in the, in the Old Testament, I'm going to give you other examples in the Old Testament that help us to see this truth. Uh, other examples? Uh, well, first of all, I want to read this before I look at these examples. In John uh, chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus stated, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they, the scriptures, are they which testify who witness of me. Now, we know there's prophetic scripture and everything that witnesses of him, but this olive tav is also another witness. Uh, here in Joshua now, looking at Joshua, the next example, chapter 6, verse 2 through 5, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor, and you shall encompass the city, and all you men of war shall go about the city once, and thus shall you do six days. And the seven uh, priests shall bear before the ark the seven trumpets of ram's horns. So again, notice, seven priests, plural, and seven trumpets of ram's horn, literally seven shofars, of ram's horns, uh, plural. So you got seven, seven priests, seven trumpets, plural. And the seventh day shall you can pass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow, the priests, plural, shall blow with the trumpets, or the shofars, plural. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast on the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout, and a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now again, you constantly see uh, seven priests, seven trumpets. But when you come to verse 5, it says, And it shall come to pass, and I'm reading from the King James, that when they shall make a long blast on the ram's horn. Notice all of a sudden, uh, the ram's horn became singular and no longer plural. But it says, How shall they, plural, uh, blow one ram's horn? Well, when I actually looked in, in, in uh, my analytical key to the Old Testament, it takes the Hebrew and breaks it down to its grammatical construction. Uh, and in this particular verse, verse 5, it says, And when he, singular, and when he shall make a long blast on the ram's horn, singular. So up to this statement, it's been seven priests, plural, seven shofars, plural. But this verse says, at the end, when all at the when they marched around seven times and the priests are blowing their multiple ram's horns, it says not. It didn't say when you hear the seven priests blow the ram's horn, then you shout. They're blowing theirs, but you don't shout until you hear him singular blow the singular ram's horn. Then you will shout. Well, 
in the Hebrew, it says, And when you hear Aleph Tav, the sound of the shofar, then the people will shout. Folks, this is even there's there's evidence right here in, in, in just the plain scripture, as well as what we see in the Hebrew, that the seven priests at the end of seven times around on the seventh day, the priests, plural, shall blow their shofars, plural, but they're not instructed to shout until it says, and you, when you hear him blow his sound of the shofar singular, then is when you're to shout. Folks, Jesus has Olive Tav is Jesus marking what he's doing. Jesus has a shofar, and it was Jesus' shofar that was blown out of the heavens. When the, when the seven priests blew theirs, then he blew his out of the heavens, and when they heard that single shofar, then they were to shout to the glory of God. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. You see, and, and we see this throughout the Old Testament. Jesus, in fact, if you want to uh, see an example of of Jesus blowing uh, his shofar, uh, go to YouTube and type in ring cloud makes trumpet sound over Jerusalem. Ring cloud makes trumpet sound over Jerusalem. This took place in October 1st, uh, 2016. And it was done on the eve of the Feast of Trumpets. That's interesting that it would occur at that same town, get a, at that same time, excuse me, and, and get an idea. But you can get an idea what, what Jesus' shofar may have sounded like, what they had heard and caused them to shout. Glory to God. Uh, let me look at some other verses before my time is gone. Uh, in the book of Ruth, for instance, uh, her, her name is listed uh, 13 times. Now, besides actions like blowing the shofar, you'll find Olive Toff connected with names. You find Aleph Tav connected with Abraham, uh, Aleph Tav Isaac, Aleph Tav Jacob. You see, it was connected with people. Those who chose to follow him, the Aleph Tav was connected with their name. And now that we know the Aleph Tav is Jesus, because he said, I am, then what we have is Jesus, you know, in the Old Testament, he was putting his uh, the Aleph Tav connecting it with their name because he was, in essence, putting his signature upon them, saying, they are mine, I will pay for them when I come. Uh, because what's interesting to note is that the letter Tav is also, uh, there's the word Tav, and it means a mark. Tav itself as a letter means a mark. And the Strongs defines this as a signature. You see, Jesus is putting his signature on them, saying, I am the Olive Tav. He's putting his signature on, on those who are his. He's put his signature on the actions that he uh, did in the Old Testament. He was active throughout there, just didn't have the name Jesus until he was born a man. But here he is the Olive Tav, and he would mark his own. God always marks his own. I wish I had more time to talk about that, but I need to get done here. Uh, Rome, uh, in Ruth, we find the name of Ruth 13 times uh, in the book. And for the first few chapters, uh, she's just listed as Ruth. But once Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, redeems her, all of a sudden, you find the Aleph Tav connected with her name. Why? Because she said, to Naomi, she said, your uh, God is my God. Your people is my people. And she went through the fullness of it, being redeemed by the kinsman redeemer. And God accepted her and put his name on her, even though she was Moabitess, uh, not a Jew. But God accepted her because she, he, she did everything the word of God required to accept uh, him as, as her God. And glory to God. Anyway, um, so all of a sudden you find Olive Tav. Um, and then, uh, boy, which one do I go to? Let me see where the time is at. Uh, in, in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, And it shall come to pass in the day that I will seek to destroy 
all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This is talking about the end, uh, the battle of Armageddon that will occur in the end. Well, who's, who's the one coming? It's Jesus who's going to be the one coming against those nations that look to destroy Jerusalem. And in the Hebrew, it says, and it shall come to pass that I will seek Aleph Tav to destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. So again, there's reference, there's a specific prophecy in reference to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have the Aleph Tav in Scripture. One more that's even more uh, sure is Zechariah chapter 12 in the first part of verse 10. And it says, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the, uh, the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and the supplication. And they, the Jews, shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. Well, in the once again, in the very end, uh, they will acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. And he said, they will look upon me whom they've pierced. We know this to be in reference to the fact that the Jews were the ones who crucified him and cried out, crucify him. See, they're the ones. Even though the Romans were the ones who actually did it, it was the Jews who headed him over. It was the high priest who headed him over. And that's what must have take, had to take place. And so the Jews pierced him. We know this to be in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and in the Hebrew, it says, they shall look upon me, Aleph Tav, whom they have pierced. Here, absolute proof of the fact that the Aleph Tav in the Hebrew Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ's signature on those he claims for himself because they chose him and signature on those actions that were his throughout the Old Testament over, again, over 7,000 times. You see, oh, there's so much uh, that, that we can see in Scripture in this matter. But I need to kind of conclude this thing before time is gone. Um, the, the, the original Hebrew uh, wasn't the letters that we more commonly are familiar with that they use today whether it's this fancier calligraphy type or whether it's just the, the common uh, writing of the Hebrew every day. Uh, but in ancient times, and, and, and I'm seeing it's kind of a glare on my, uh, because of my lighting, but the Aleph was originally, they were originally pictographs. All the letters were pictographs. And, and originally the Aleph was the, 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 uh, the, an ox head because the Aleph represents strength. And, uh, it, it had a long, strong endurance, a very strong animal. And the Aleph is said to represent God. And so it rep that, that ox represents the strength of God because he is almighty. Uh, and so the Aleph. And then the Tav, meaning a mark, was represented by this symbol. Uh, does, does that look familiar to you? You see, in in ancient times, God used this, taught them to use this to represent the Tav uh, long before Roman crucifixion that this symbol would eventually represent. And this uh, is a cross, kind of turned a little bit, but represent, it, is a, it means, but it's like an X almost, with one of them a little shorter, because it means a mark. And uh, just like when when, when the ox would be used to plow a field because of its strength, there would be a certain mark that the ox would take them to to keep the furrows straight. And so they would follow a mark. And Jesus said, use this to describe himself. I am the olive tar. Through my strength, through my strength, I will bring you to redemption. Which this symbol, this mark, is now a representation of redemption, what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. He said, I am uh, the Aleph and the Tav. And you got to take note that God, and, and, and I love this because God always marks his own. And so since I do have a little bit more time here, I do want to share this one thing, uh, uh, that how God marks his own. Uh, uh, we, we see it here, uh, we see it in the 144,000 and so on, but there was a missionary uh, in Central America who, when he first got there, uh, the witch doctors heard, you know, heard of him, so the witch doctor you know, sent a curse against him. Well, when you know the authority in the name of Jesus, you take authority over that curse that no curse will come upon you, but you take authority over it. Well, you know, the curse causes shall not come, the Bible says, which means like a sparrow by wandering, 
the cursed causal shall not one. When the sparrow wanders, can't find what it's looking for, it goes back to its nest. So when you take authority, the curse can't rest on you, it goes back to you. And so that curse went back to that witch doctor. He was able to reach that witch doctor for the Lord after all that happened. And so the, the, it was the number one witch doctor. And when number one witch doctor um, accepted the Lord, then the number two witch doctor became number one. He sent a curse against him. Well, he took authority again in the name of Jesus, and it went back on him. He was able through that to reach this man uh, to the Lord. So the, 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 the uh, witch doctor that was number two that became number one uh, accepted the Lord. So the one that was number three. That became number two is now number one. He sent a curse against him. He used the authority in the name of Jesus and had to read. Uh, and uh, and it, it, the curse went back on him. Uh, he went to be, visit the man in the hospital and led him to the Lord. So the, 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 the witch doctor that was number four, that came number three, that became number two is now number one. Uh, he, he was nowhere to be found. <laughs> but this first witch doctor had accepted the Lord. He said, I want to get up and share with people. And he felt good about it in his heart to let him get up and share. And he said, he said, you know, as witch doctors, we see and hear things in the spirit realm. And he said, when a Christian comes into our area, he said, we see the name of Jesus written across their forehead in blood. You see, God marks his own. And he said, then we hear a herald go forth. Attention, a child of God is in the area. And he said, it makes us tremble. He said, but we will test and see if they know who they are. Well, this missionary knew who he was, and they found out real quick. And that's why the fourth one, he just went and hid. So, folks, just know this. Jesus is the Aleph Tav. He's the fulfillment of all this Old Testament. He's the, he marks his own. He is our redemption. He's the strength that brought us, to, who is God, that brought us to redemption. And he has marked us uh, as his own. Glory to God. Well, uh, I don't have much time left here, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude this, trusting that it has been a blessing to you. Uh, so this is uh, Pete Bartolazzi saying, be blessed.